Good evening, everyone. So I am Brooke Clement. I am the director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. As always, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. And I want to thank you for your continued support of the Library and Museum, and thanks to our great partners at the Foundation. We are winding down our programming before the summer months. So in fact, we only have one more event, and that's tomorrow. So just a quick, quick reminder that tomorrow evening at 6, not 7, 6, we will have, a, have Doug Stanton here. Uh, he wrote Horse Soldiers, which was the basis for the movie 12 Strong. So I hope you'll be able to join us again tomorrow. And now I'm going to turn it over to Morel. Um, Morel Lukey is our curator, and she is going to be introducing our speaker tonight. Good evening, everyone. As Brooke mentioned, I'm the curator here, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine Kramer Brownell, uh, who is this evening's speaker. She's an associate professor of history at Purdue University and a senior editor at the Made by History column at the Washington Post. Her research and teaching focus on the intersections between media, politics, and popular culture, with a particular emphasis on the American presidency. Her first book, Showbiz Politics, Hollywood in American Political Life, which was published in 2014 by the University of North Carolina Press, examines the institutionalization of entertainment styles and structures in American politics and the rise of the celebrity presidency. And this book will be available for purchase and signing after the event. Her second book, 24-7 Politics, Cable Television and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News, will be published in August by Princeton University Press. It excavates how the growth of cable television transformed American political life by tethering politics to profits and catering to narrow audiences rather than finding common ground. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brownell to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much to the Gerald Ford Museum for inviting me to speak today and to all of you for coming to hear about my work. And a special thank you to Brooke um, and Morel and the entire staff of the, the Ford Museum and Foundation for all of your hospitality and, and, and your support of my work. I've, I've actually spent a lot of time at the Gerald Ford uh, Library in Ann Arbor, and it's wonderful to be back here in Grand Rapids as well. As a native Michigander, I love any opportunity uh, to come up north and be in my home state. And it was especially wonderful to get a private tour of the museum today with Morel. And I learned so much uh, more about presidential history. But I also loved all of the history I learned about the University of Michigan. Um, I um, am a Wolverine, and um, it was great to kind of see that history as well. One of the other really great things about the, the current traveling or the current exhibit um, on guitars and kind of using guitars and popular culture into a lens in, into American history and the presidency more broadly that I really admired is that it takes entertainment and it takes popular culture, things that people enjoy consuming. It takes it seriously as part of politics. And I think that it's very common to treat popular culture and politics in one of two ways. The first is to treat it as merely fluff in the political process, that something that is fun and inconsequential. Uh, it's a distraction, if you will. Or there's another way that people frequently think about popular culture and in cultural developments, especially if they're linked to technological changes in the media. Um, so when you think about the rise of the celebrity presidency or perhaps the current emergence of political echo chambers through on cable news channels, many people assume that these things happened naturally, that perhaps they were preordained because of the nature of that particular uh, medium. 
uh, Jack Valenti, a former aide to Lyndon Johnson, um, and the president of the Motion Picture Association, once reiterated this, this way of thinking uh, when during the 1990s he observed that, quote, movie stars and politicians share the same DNA in their ser search for per or desire to perform for an audience and search of applause. But my research in both of my books uh, shows that this intersection of media, popular culture, and presidential politics that turned uh, the, the president into an entertainer in chief is actually, ha has been a very controversial development. Um, it's one that's rooted in decades of negotiations between pr professional performers, business leaders, and politicians. It is also rooted in key policy shifts as well that have shaped how media industries function and interact with elected officials and democratic institutions. And this is something that has long been neglected in how we think about the politics of popular culture, particularly when it comes to understanding media industries and their products. As Clay Whitehead, who was a director of the Office of Telecommunications Policy under Richard Nixon, he was frequently frustrated um, by this lack of public knowledge on how TV actually functioned. And he noted during one, uh, one congressional hearing when he's talking about television's regulatory policies that people spend hours a day watching television, but they had little understanding of what he called the corporate and government forces behind the medium that so fundamentally shaped their lives. And I think this is still true for many television viewers or streamers or social media users today. Popular culture can serve presidential priorities, certainly as administrations can use it to shape news agendas and even circumvent the press corps and speak directly to the American people. But it is also essential to remember that Hollywood, the television industry, and social media and tech companies today, that they're businesses. And they are more concerned about profits than anything else. Executives in, in all of these worlds have long looked to curry favor with politicians to advance their bottom line. And this can be selling their product or having legislative friends when regulatory or tax issues come up. So it's important not to dismiss popular culture and especially media productions as merely fluff or distractions in politics. Rather, we should think of, the, of it as something that shapes and is shaped by political pressures, campaign strategies, and economic structures. So to show you how all of these issues intersect, I want to focus on several questions that center on the rise and the transformation of the entertainer in chief. And so I want us to dig into today three main questions. First, how did performative politics become so central to the presidency? And then how has the role of the entertainer in chief changed and evolved as the broadcasting era of constructed consensus gave way to the cable television era of fragmentation? And since we are here at the Gerald Ford Museum, where does Gerald Ford, a president popularly known more for his media struggles than triumphs, how does he fit into this broader narrative? To answer these questions, I want to dig into three key, very memorable uh, moments um, in the evolution of the entertainer in chief over the past half century and to show how these well-known moments reflect shifting ideas about the power of media in American politics and also the very policies that are shaping the business of television. On the surface, Richard Nixon's decision to appear on Laffin as a last-ditch effort to win votes in 1968 may appear the same as Ron Nesson, uh, uh, Gerald Ford's press secretary, his decision to appear on Saturday Night Live, and Bill Clinton's decision to appear on MTV in 1992. 
And I certainly make the argument in the conclusion of my first book that each involve a strategy of using entertainment to bypass the press and speak directly to voters to sell their personalities on the campaign trail. But my new book shows that there's actually more to the story as well. And unpacking the shifting media landscape from Nixon to Ford to Clinton illuminates significant changes in how popular culture is used as a political tool and as a consequence, how embracing such political entertainment has changed how the public interacts with the president and how the public consumes political information. My first book, Showbiz Politics, examines how new technologies, notably radio, then motion pictures, and then television, brought alternative ways for presidents to win elections and to govern. It opened up opportunities for political parties to rethink communication strategies and party building strategies. I, I, I define showbiz politics as the reliance on the active construction of a celebrity persona as a path to claim political legitimacy, something that John F. Kennedy did very controversially in 1960 as he took to the primary trail to appeal to voters as Jack Kennedy fans. And that was one of the really fascinating documents that I found in the Kennedy Library is that it's a memo saying we need to appeal to voters as fans first. He did defeat the more powerful political insider, Lyndon Johnson, in winning the presidential no nomination with this strategy. And he narrowly beat out Richard Nixon that fall. But such a strategy actually generated as much criticism as it did acclaim for being too much about style and not enough about substance. <laughs> That's why, while Kennedy experimented with, with such a strategy, it was a bitter and defeated Richard Nixon who actually truly ingrained it in presidential politics. So here's how. Two years after Richard lost the, the 1960 race to Kennedy, he suffered another political defeat, this time the California governor's race. In the Beverly Hilton Hotel, he lashed out at reporters in what he called his last press conference, where he infamously made that declaration, you don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. This moment captured Nixon's anger at the media and his belief that a media bias had personally targeted, targeted him and had undermined his political career. As he was wallowing in this defeat, he thought long and hard about the 1960 election. He thought long and hard about the television debates and his performance on TV. But he thought more broadly about Nick, or Kennedy's approach to media politics through the entire campaign. And he attributed Kennedy's political success to his embrace of showbiz politics, of turning himself into this dynamic celebrity that people just couldn't get enough of. He thought that was how he won the presidency. And so Nixon is studying this, and he saw the possibilities of revamping his political um, strategy to emulate Kennedy's approach, as he wanted to resurrect his presidential aspirations uh, uh, in 1968. For him, political entertainment would solve the issue of media bias, which he defined as both negative coverage and lack of coverage. Entertainment could create new opportunities to appear on television and to do so in ways that allowed him to control more of the narrative and how his, his personality was presented. As one advisor, this is another great find from the Nixon Library. As one advisor wrote to him, he said, Nixon's biggest challenge in 1968 was the fact that people had a gut instinct that they didn't like him. <laughs> So the mission was, how do we change this? Uh, we need to make him more likable. And if we make him more likable, people might trust him more. <laughs> and so he revamped his political career uh, by, by trying to turn himself into a celebrity the same way that Kennedy had. 
He started appearing on entertainment shows like the Jack Parr program, where he didn't talk about policies, he played the piano. Mm -hmm. He then went to the Mike Douglas show, a daytime entertainment sh uh, talk show, where he met producer Roger Ailes. Before appearing on that program, Nixon grumbled to Ailes that he had to engage in gimmicks like this in order to get elected. And Ailes shook his head and he said, television is not a gimmick. You need to take it seriously and make it a centerpiece of your campaign. And then he brought Ailes on board to his campaign and with Ailes' help, he did. That's why he went on laughing in a very awkward 10 second clip. And I wanted to show you the video of this in SNL and MTV, but unfortunately because of technological considerations with streaming, we cannot play video. So I'll do my best to, to reenact it. Um, it's very simple. It's very awkward. It took many takes. Um, and if you don't remember it or haven't seen it, I encourage you to Google it when you get home. Uh, where he used the, the show's catchphrase, sock it to me, but he said it in a very interesting way. Asked it almost as a question, sock it to me? In Nixon's mind, this helped deliver the election for him. He truly believed uh, that his transformation from loser to victor in 1968 hinged on prioritizing television and controlling his images through these types of appearances. I want to hammer home a point here, that this was a belief. There are many reasons why Nixon squeaked out a victory uh, that fall in a very close election year in which the Democratic Party erupted in chaos at its convention in August and George Wallace was running as a third party candidate. But Nixon, his media advisors and journalists chronicling the campaign repeatedly pointed to a shift in media strategy as the determining factor. And it altered how politicians ran their campaigns in the 1970s as they sprinted to media consultants like Ailes and a variety of pollsters to create their own Nixon miracle. This belief in the political power and necessity of television also shaped how Nixon then governed, a story that is at the core of my new book, 24-7 Politics. And while it's not available here, you can pre-order it online. <laughs> Shameless plug. Hmm. But here's the ironic thing. Nixon took advantage of an entertainment television system that he also simultaneously wanted to destroy. He believed that the laugh instant was powerful because he could make himself likable to millions of Americans without having to get tripped up by any question about policies or, what, or how, uh, his, his vision for the future. And Laughin' was the highest rated show on a television dial in which only three networks competed for viewers. But he saw that reach as certainly advantageous, advantageous on the campaign trail, and he, he would use it. But he saw it very problematic as president because he felt that network television had too much power and that it was fundamentally against him personally. The three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, did dominate the information that Americans received about the world around them. Viewers had only three choices to watch entertainment and the news, affording networks a huge amount of political power. So when Richard Nixon was in office, he, felt he worked to break down the economic and political power of the big three television networks because he thought their programs, both news and entertainment, but especially news, uh, were liberally biased and inherently out to get him. To do this, he established the Office of Telecommunications Policy, headed by Clay Whitehead, pictured here. The OTP pursued, one of, my, one of my favorite archival findings is this document that I came across in Clay Whitehead's papers. And it's the project that the OTP pursued um, following Nixon's reelection in 1972. They called it Project Bun, which I later learned stood for Break Up Networks. 
And it was a very thorough, very comprehensive way to change policy um, and to turn to a new media technology, cable television, as a tool to wage his war against network television. At the time, cable television was a highly regulated medium. And per FCC policy, it could not compete with broadcast television and even enter some of the top television markets across the country. So it overwhelmingly just extended the reach of broadcasting into areas that, that couldn't get the signal, perhaps because of terrain or they were in rural areas far away um, from a city. And so it just extended the reach of broadcasting initially and didn't actually offer alternative programming to compete against network television. This began to change under Richard Nixon because he viewed cable television as a political weapon to undermine the power of network television and to also advance a free market policy agenda. In doing so, Nixon changed the political trajectory and structure of cable television, helping to shape its development as a disruptive media medium designed to tear down media gatekeeping with market forces. And so this is the media environment that Gerald Ford inherited. And ironically, in his efforts to restore integrity to the presidency, he actually advanced these two components of uh, Richard Nixon's media politics, his showbiz style and his cable agenda. Here's how it worked. Gerald Ford had confronted the challenge of how to communicate govern, and then win an election in a political environment that one journalist characterized as a disillusionment that had turned into ridicule. He faced a cynical press corps who had witnessed Nixon lying and the extensive efforts that he went into to manipulate the press. And he faced a public that had lost faith and trust in the presidency. For Ford, Entertainment became a way to restore that trust by personalizing and humanizing the presidency. But he notably wanted to do it differently than Nixon and to use popular culture to bring that celebrity making apparatus that Nixon had so carefully hidden. He wanted to bring it into public conversations about how the presidency operated so people could understand it rather than be manipulated by it. He wanted transparency over secrecy. So his new press secretary, Ron Nesson, frequently shared stories about the behind the scenes production, working to dispel suspicions that any TV performance or address was just about manipulation. The goal is to show that you could use TV, you could use a, a staged event to actually convey a sense of authenticity. And yet, time and time again, Nesson struggled to counter what he called in his memoir, quote, Ford's biggest continuing problem in the White House, the portrayal of him in the media as a bumbler. Of course, no one has made this so powerful quite like Chevy Chase. When he first saw Chevy Chase performing as the bumbling Gerald Ford on the edgy new show Saturday Night, it was called Saturday Night, its first season, uh, not Saturday Night Live. Uh, it took on that third word uh, later on. He, he cringed, but he also wondered if this actually might be an opportunity to use humor to embrace it and advance the administration's goals. And so, uh, Gerald Ford invited Chevy Chase as a guest to the Radio Television Correspondents Association dinner in March of 1976. And there he made this announcement that Ford would send his own representative to, cho to join Chase's show the following month. And so Ron Nesson did exactly that, guest hosting Saturday night on April 17th. The episode begins with a pre-taped segment by Gerald Ford from the Oval Office. He opened up the episode with its signature, live from New York, it's Saturday night. And so he did inject himself slightly into that show. But it was really Ron Nesson uh, who was the guest host, who was the, the star of many of the, the different skits that he was in. And it's a really fascinating episode um, uh, that I encourage you to, to watch the entire episode. 
I think the most significant part is this scene where he's in the Oval Office and he's playing himself um, and Chevy Chase is playing um, President Ford. And in this scene, they're actually discussing his decision to, to join the show and to guest host the show. So kind of fabricating perhaps what actually happened. And there's a really powerful moment here where Nesson says, and that's why I want you to host the show, to demonstrate that this administration has a sense of humor. You may remember that in 1968, Nixon said, sock it to me on laughing, and that may have made the difference in that election. Privately, Nesson had discussed how Nixon's laughing stint had actually hurt the former president. He called it undignified. And actually, in the first year of Ford's administration, they emphasized that he is the president. He is not an entertainer. They wanted to really distinguish him as something different from what Nixon had done. But then he goes on the show in public statements where he's crediting Laffin as giving Nixon that win um, is ultimately um, it's, it's, um, contributing to this growing political belief that media image mattered more than anything else in American political life and that entertainment could make a difference. It also really elevates the visibility of shows like Saturday Night Live. Again, whether or not this actually did make a difference, um, that didn't matter as much as this growing belief that we need these types of shows in order to get, election, or get elected and to govern. And indeed, that year, at that very moment, Ford was not alone in his search for free media and the use of political entertainment to advance presidential aspirations. At that exact same time, a former actor, Ronald Reagan, was launching a substantial battle um, against Ford for the GOP nomination. And he used his experience uh, as an actor as an asset, not a liability. And this is a shift, because in 1968, when, uh, when people talked about Reagan and maybe him running for uh, president at that year, people dismissed him as, but he's, he's an actor. Can he really be president? That had changed by 1976. That November, Jimmy Carter beat Ford at the polls with a groundbreaking media operation that included many things, starting with the primary where he decided, I'll go to Iowa because no one else is there. And then I can create a media story of momentum that, um, that, that, that then will shape the entire nomination process. So it began in the primaries, but then it continued through an incredibly well orchestrated um, uh, Democratic National Convention that was uh, dismissed by so many journalists as 11 because there was no controversy or actual political work being done, to using rock concerts and a variety of celebrity surrogates to campaign for him and to raise money. So Ford's efforts to restore integrity to the po po policy process is the other layer of this. And it also unintentionally advanced Nixon's media agenda in regards to cable television. So he's really in, in, in further ingraining this idea of the celebrity presidency, but he's also seeing cable as a viable option and in making people see the potential of cable television. When he took office, Ford pledged that straight talk would be a pillar of his administration, especially around the issue of regulatory reform, which he wanted to make the centerpiece of his administration. Because the cable television debate had previously been shaped by Nixon's media war against network television, Ford had economists take the lead to study the issue of cable reform in a way that tried to constantly focus the attention to the economic statistics of deregula deregulating cable television. And he, he constantly said, let's not have fear drive these regulatory debates. Let's have facts. And in his domestic policy team took this very, very seriously. And they advanced a lot of research on the issue to show that cable television didn't necessarily mean that it would undermine network broadcasting, but rather it could expand the entire business of television. But despite really, again, folders and folders of research on this at the Ford Library, um, there are many extensive efforts. It seems like it's gaining way and there's, there's a momentum. Such efforts then suddenly stopped in March of 1976. 
And it's for two reasons. Broadcasters continued to pounce on the anti-media legacy of Nixon to constantly torpedo any type of cable reform. Perhaps more significantly, broadcasters privately threatened that advancing cable legislation, which they understood to hurt their pocketbooks, might influence their, their news coverage of Ford, who needed TV access for his campaign. This threat had long boosted the economic authority of broadcasters. As Ford's head economist noted in one memo, politicians were unwilling to, quote, assault the television establishment and thus conceivably jeopardize the most important of individual objectives, re-election, reappointment, or future employment by the industry. And so in the end, despite months and months of meetings and all of this research and summits with economists, it just stopped, and Ford didn't push forward on the cable legislation. And, and I, this, uh, this is a cover of CATV, a cable tra trade magazine, um, from after, after everything stopped. And the Ford administration said that they didn't, they didn't need to actually do more. They, they weren't ready for legislation. They needed more research. And there's a bubble there that says, um, Paul, it's an election year. The broadcasters are screaming, and we need them. We've got to save the president from himself. Just tell him we need more research. That should put an end to this whole thing. And, and the, the, the documents in the Ford Library do reveal that he was concerned about losing broadcaster support. Um, in the aftermath of the election, his team said, do you want to revisit this? And they thought, no, that would actually make it, all of these reports look true. Um, because uh, and we don't want it to look like we just catered down to broadcasting lobbying. Nevertheless, others on Capitol Hill found the research that Ford's team had produced compelling. And they too began thinking about the possibilities of expanding cable television in their own quest to gain more access to television, which they saw now as indispensable to their own political success in the House and in the Senate, but also necessary for Congress to counter the, the president's television bully pulpit. And so when Tip O'Neill became Speaker of the House following the very election that ousted Ford from office, he made televising Congress a priority. Savvy cable leaders pounced on the opportunity, believing that regulatory reform demanded ingratiating the cable industry into politics, the way that broadcasters had, that they just watched unfold. Um, indeed, since the mid-1960s, cable advocates had identified political coverage um, as a public relations strategy with one businessman even proposing to fund congressional television in 1969. And you can see here in the highlighted area, it says congressmen are mainly concerned about what CATV, which used to be the term for cable television, can do for them. And the, the, then the, the following one, it really emphasizes that our findings indicate that congressional report, his proposed program, will represent a significant and meaningful breakthrough in legislative relations. But it took the right moment and the right person to ultimately make this a reality. Brian Lamb, uh, who had actually worked for Richard Nixon in the Office of Telecommunications Policy, uh, he understood media policy. He understood Capitol Hill, and he understood the White House. And he got buy-in from Congress and the industry to finally push forward C-SPAN in 1979. As Lamb later explained in an oral history, his sales pitch was simple. If you want to be taken seriously in Washington or in the country, you will have to build a base of doing something other than entertainment and sports. The way that CBS, NBC, and ABC became powerful and important was through the news. Yes, it was a public service funded by a private industry, and it still is. But operators also recognized, they bought into this idea because they thought it could be a public relations tool to make legislators aware of the possibilities of cable and then to become invested in expanding that business. It was good for them politically. And so the dramatic expansion of cable television in the 1980s reshaped modes of political entertainment by introducing the concept of narrow casting political ideas to niche audiences. 
Daytime television had news programs that targeted women. And evangelical programs like Pat Robertson's 700 Club had news programs that geared uh, all of the information about the world around them and public affairs to social conservatives. One observer noted in 1984 that this proliferation of lifestyle cable shows and networks posed a, quote, new and disruptive marriage between television and politics with substantial consequences. In this article for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Dr. Monroe Price, someone who had studied cable television extensively for the past decade and had been involved in many of these research experiments, he, or, um, he predicted that, quote, the ability to marshal the inventive and magical power of carefully edited images to create an intensity of emotion for a particular point of view will yield television to a new heights, or, or television propaganda to new heights or new depths. He certainly was right. But it took another key moment to get there, and that is the 1992 election and Bill Clinton's turn to MTV. Certainly, this follows in Nixon and Ford's steps, but I would argue that it also illuminates a key difference in the nature of the entertainer in chief in the age of cable television. Clinton accepted the invitation to appear on the program out of sheer desperation. It was July 1992. He was way behind in the polls, and his campaign was just hemorrhaging money and struggling to raise any money. And he, he, wanted, he was willing to try anything. He went on talk radio. He went on all sorts of daytime talk shows. And he even accepted an invitation by MTV to participate in this town hall conversation in a program called Choose or Lose. And it was on this show that he seemed to get his groove back. According to one observer, Clinton was, quote, click, or, sorry, quick, not slick. Sympathetic, not condescending. Imaginative, not wordy. His appearance on the show uplifted the entire campaign, argued many observers as they're watching this, because it evaded the elitist news programming of network broadcast television. And it had real conversations as they were framed. Again, this idea of authenticity. Um, real conversations with the voters. But there's a difference between Nixon's appearance on Laughing and Clinton's appearance on MTV. Nixon appeared for less than 10 seconds to a massive audience in this effort to make himself more likable. Um, it's just a very cameo appearance. He doesn't talk about policies. He just promotes his personality to let people know that he's here and he's fun. Clinton, however, spoke on MTV's town hall for over an hour. He had little pushback from Tabitha Soren, who was hosting the event. And he fully dominated discussions of his policies and some of the controversies that his campaign had encountered in the recent weeks. While framed as a news event, it was more like partisan television that Clinton used to cultivate this loyalty to him. MTV News had a different objective. They, they, sure, they wanted to add to the civic conversation, but their goal was to keep viewers from turning the channel. Uh, they also were aware, as many other cable operators were, who launched a variety of other political entertainment experiments on shows like Comedy Central, Central and Nickelodeon, they were aware that Congress was debating at that very same time a bill to re-regulate the industry. And so the programs were profitable for the cable industry and politically advantageous to the presidential administrations. So what is the relationship between popular culture and presidential politics? What is the legacy of this shift of the entertainer in chief from the broadcasting era of constructed consensus to the cable era of fragmentation? During the 2016 election, Tabitha Soren looked back very cynically on this legacy of the MTV presidency. She wrote in this op-ed in the New York Times that despite its best attempts to engage voters, it was what she called out as the pretense of political coverage. The pretense of a lot of political coverage today is that it aims to improve and edify our civic life. The reality, she wrote, is that it's just whoring for our attention. 
As a historian, I think that the key lesson to understand is that media, entertainment, and political institutions shape one another, and they evolve to alongside one another. As one media scholar um, put it, it early on in the, 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 the field in the 1960s, we share our tools and thereafter, or we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. Presidents and their team of savvy advisors make choices on how to use media for political communication. They also make policy decisions on the rules structuring media businesses, something executives understand as they make their programming choices. All of these decisions are intertwined and consequential, but they aren't always obvious to viewers. And this is the important takeaway. Entertainment is everywhere in politics. It's in the White House, it's in your news coverage, it's on the campaign trail, it's in your social media feed, it's everywhere. But understanding how it works is essential to being able to decode it and not to be deceived and manipulated by it. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions um, as well. And I'm told that we need to wait till you have a microphone before um, asking the questions so that people streaming and on C-SPAN can hear the question. If you look at the changing technology that's going on today, what's your prediction of, of what a speech like this would be like in 25 years? A great question, and as I always tell, I had a, a conversation with a reporter just two days ago who said, what's going to happen with the cable news industry now that streaming is really upending it? And I said, well, I'm a historian. I don't make predictions. <laughs> but I do think that something to think about is that the nature of television has, has changed um, with the subscription model that, that, um, that cable television did introduce. And so we have streaming which is about loyalty, right? You're loyal to a particular channel, a particular app that you're getting all of your information from. And so I think that this fragmentation is becoming more and more individualized, more and more personalized. And I think that's another development that we, and that will continue, even as the business structures change, uh, even as streaming, maybe you know, cable news will, will look very differently, um, if it exists at all. Um, uh, but I think that some of these key features of how it functions in terms of a business, that idea of catering to individual preferences, um, keeping them in these echo chambers, it's, a, it's profitable. And I, that was what was really shocking when I saw a network executive who would not remain or be named, uh, but actually say to a reporter after 1992 that this is all about profits. Keeping people so they don't leave the channel is really good business for us. And delivering entertainment that's personalized to them is a way to do that. And I think that will continue to intensify as people have all of this choice. Um, but they have to pay for those services. And they're not paying in carriage fees now. They're paying out of their pockets in a way that's a little bit more clear that, that they're, they're purchasing it. I'm surprised you skipped right over the Gipper. <laughs> Uh, you know, the other politicians, I'm over here, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I, I raised my hand that the microphone was already here. Um, you know, with, with Clinton and Kennedy and Nixon, all politicians who tried to use the media, whereas Reagan was already in the media and in Hollywood before politics. So did that give him an edge then in already being a national figure, being known? Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts there? Yes, uh, it's actually one of the surprising things from my research is that I came to the first book project, actually, and the second book project, thinking that these are stories about Ronald Reagan, right? Ronald Reagan ushered in the celebrity presidency. Ronald Reagan, at the era of deregulation and the growth of cable in the 1980s, that's got to be because of Ronald Reagan, right? That was my assumption going into it. And my research actually shows that Reagan capitalized on these changing cultural values, these changing ways in which campaigns operated in the 1960s, going to the primary trail, appealing to people as fans. This ultimately created a political and a cultural system in which he could say that he represented the people, that his performance, uh, his ability to perform was part of his qualifications. 
Um, and, and so he makes that argument when he runs for governor in 1966. He calls himself the citizen politician, that because he was an actor, he understood the people better. And that's why he should win election. Um, at that time, you know, his acting background was still controversial. But the really fascinating thing is that Nixon helps make it not controversial. Um, he, he, he really, he's studying Reagan. And uh, there are boxes and boxes at the Nixon Library that are just labeled Reagan Research, where Nixon is studying Reagan um, and seeing that, wow, he's gotten this ability to connect with audiences. There's a line that says, what he's saying isn't necessarily new, but he makes it newsworthy. And, and so he's, he is emulating Kennedy and emulating Reagan. And so, uh, but you know, I really argue, I conclude the first book with Nixon rather than Reagan, because I think these changes that Nixon helps to usher in then pave the way for Ronald Reagan. And the same thing with the, the cable television. Um, it's, there is a fascinating document in the Reagan Library where it's actually this very thick plan that is a plan for a presidential re-election cable channel that uh, this, this producer wants to produce, that it's an entire cable channel that they're going to develop just to re-elect the president. It's very thorough, very thorough. And it says that this is going to be the most revolutionary thing since the 1960 television debates. Um, and his team, uh, uh, Reagan's team, ultimately, they debate it. They go back and forth on prices with this producer. And then ultimately, they reject it. And I argue that's because Reagan is very much of the broadcasting era. He was grew. He was raised in the broadcasting era. He was groomed in the broadcasting era. And he thought about television as a way to kind of generate consensus. And what he wanted to do, especially in the 1984 election, was to make conservatism popular. He didn't want to slice and dice the electorate to kind of motivate a more impassioned minority. He wanted to make his agenda popular. He was very concerned about popularity of his ideas and himself as a person. And so I think broadcasting actually met what he wanted to do politically as well. And so he, he does have a good relationship with the cable industry. He sees its expansion as proof that deregulation works. But in fact, um, the deregulatory impulses are come a decade before him um, and just are very much on display. Um, in, by the 1980s. So I have, I have a question. Yeah. So up until 1985, all the major networks were under what was called the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, and in 1985, the F FCC kind of self-terminated uh, the Fairness Doctrine, um, uh, allowing kind of an open, open, open world with regard to uh, equal time. In your, in, your, in, in your opinion, how did that affect uh, the country kind of going forward with kind of what we see now on cable, on cable news and on network TV? Mm -hmm. Great question. And so one of the really interesting things about the Fairness Doctrine is that the FCC starts to pull back. So deregulation was not just about markets, it was about deregulating the rules. Right? So the, the FCC um, in the 1930s uh, imposed, a, in, in 1940s, imposed a variety of different rules that kind of regulated programming behavior that set on fair, the Fairness Doctrine that you had to present, con or issues of public importance, you had to present both sides of that. Um, it mandated things like equal time for, um, for the different candidates running uh, for, for office, that if you gave it to one candidate at a certain time or at, at a certain rate, you had to give the same time at the same rate to another candidate. So there are all of these different rules that I call kind of these guardrails um, on, on kind of this commercialized public sphere. So I would argue that cable tele or sorry, broadcasting ushers in this commercialized public sphere where there are expectations that there should be some, some rules regulating uh, discourse and regulating programming so people can be more informed. Um, those ultimately start to disappear, um, thanks to Mark Fowler. Or Fowler. Um, he uh, he kind of do, doesn't says that he's not going to enforce them initially. He kind of does like a wink, wink to the networks, like I'm not I'm not really paying attention to this. Um, and then ultimately, um, when there is kind of a, he he makes a serious move on that, Congress actually a bipartisan coalition in Congress. 
comes together to try to pass legislation uh, to reinstate the Fairness Doctrine, uh, because they actually see that as really important as a way to get other different voices. This is something that both liberals and conservatives could agree on. Uh, but that legislation is ultimately vetoed by Ronald Reagan, uh, because he says, again, the marketplace can deliver um, this diversity of perspectives, and then people can choose in there. And so I think part of the decline of the Fairness Doctrine is this reliance on the marketplace to deliver democratic debate and discourse. And, um, and in the end, it does not, it generates, it, it allows what sells, it allows what's a higher rating to dominate the, the conversation rather than here's an informed um, uh, analysis of the different issues and the different angles. And so I think that's one of the things that's at the heart of my new book is that what happens when we have this deregulated media environment and what I call a privatized public sphere, a public sphere in which there are, there are none of these rules uh, regulating civic or, or mandating uh, civic contributions. Rather, it's just a reliance on the marketplace to deliver um, democracy. And I think um, ultimately, again, um, that can work in theory, but all of the, the profits have ultimately um, undermined uh, having an, an, an informed citizenry. Mm -hmm.